Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. And welcome to the Ramon Areces Foundation. On its behalf, I would like to thank you for your participation in this event. My, na my name is Manuel Aguilar, a member of the Scientific Council of the Foundation and academician in the Royal Academy of Sciences. My speciality has nothing to do with the topic of this afternoon because it's experimental physics of high uh, of elementary particles. At present, I'm a researcher emeritus of the CIEMAT. As many of you know, the Areces Foundation has a long uh, trajectory in track record in encouraging f projects and activities related with science and technology. The Areces Foundation has achieved these activities in the framework of collaboration with other institutions and organizations with uh, similar interests, as for instance, the Royal Academy of Sciences, the Royal Spanish Society of Physics, the Royal Society, Spanish Society of Chemistry, the Royal Society of uh, Spanish Mathematics, the universities and the research centers, and as well other foundations and centers, both national and international. The lecture this afternoon is a good example of what I have just said. It's fruit of the collaboration between the Ramon Areces Foundation with the Royal Academy of Sciences and with the Complutense University of Madrid. It's also adequate to mention here, as former speaker of the diversity of the topics that have been dealt with in recent years, the Areces Foundation has had the honor of listening in its uh, headquarters or its venue uh, many uh, important chemists, particularly the Nobel Prizes in Chemistry, Jean-Marie Lem, Jean-Pierre Cheval, Richard Henderson, and Joachim Frank. Before giving the floor to Professor Elizabeth Stillo, who is going to be introducing our speaker today, I would like to briefly point out that the topic and the lecture this afternoon are extremely relevant in the setting of the energy, energy transition and climate change. It's adequate to re remind you that the Nobel Committee did show while awarding the Chemistry Nobel Prize in 2019 to Akira Yoshiro, John and Michael Stanley Whittingham, that the awarded people set the basis for a wireless society, free society, free fuel, fossil, fossil fuel free, that has enormous advantages for mankind, pointing out that the storage of energy, and particularly the storage based on electrochemistry is critical in order to make possible the electrical economy as it was possible at the, in due time when we had the revolution in the communications. The lithium battery, batteries have played until now a decisive role, but electrochemistry is also essential for the success of an economy based on clean hydrogen and on the development of a mining industry that is cleaner, that should be based on electroreduction instead of the carbothermal processes. During this conference, Professor Whittingham will discuss about the current situation of storage and particularly so of lithium batteries and the challenges that we face in order to invent a new generation of devices. Thanking Professor Whittingham for his collaboration with the Ramon Areces Foundation and also Professor Miguel Angel Alario, who proposed this scientific session and got in touch with our guest. I give the floor now to Professor Elizabeth Castillo at the same time that I thank all of you for your presence this afternoon in this foundation, wishing you to enjoy a lecture on a topic that is really very uh, actual right now. Thank you very much, Manuel. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes, Professor Whittingham. 
First of all, I would like to thank the Ramon Areces Foundation, its president, Don Raimundo Perez Fernandez, the academicians and all the academic authorities, Professor Manuel Aguilar and Professor Miguel Angel Alario, for giving us the opportunity, more specifically to me, to introduce today Professor Sandy Whittingham, but not so much to, for introducing him, that it's, that it's a great honor for me, but also to be able to listen to him, for having him here with us and be able to enjoy listening to him personally. We are given today a great opportunity when we can listen firsthand to Professor Stanley Whittingham that today is going to talk to us about the critical role of energy storage in the setting of climate change. As Professor Manuel Aguilar has already mentioned, it's a very important ish topic and of a great concern for all of us. Professor Whittingham has achieved important, very important contributions for the, invent the invention of the battery of lithium ion. And we all have them in our pockets. We have them in our mobile phones, in our portable computers. And as has been mentioned by Professor Aguilar, as the academy that awarded the Nobel Prize mentioned, he has set the basis so that our society is wireless, so that we can have an instantaneous communication, but also so that we have a society that is fossil free, a fossil fuel free. And that's what we have to be working for in order to achieve a cleaner society. And for all of that, the Swedish Academy decided to award the Nobel Prize in Chemistry to Professor Michael Stanley Whittingham together with Akira Josino, just from the Yakasaki Hub Corporation, and John Barrister from the Texas University. Before giving the floor to our uh, speaker, I would like to take a couple of minutes in order to introduce briefly his scientific career. Professor Michael Stanley Whittingham made his PhD in the Oxford University in inorganic chemistry, and we could specify that in the chemistry of solid state. He studied during his PhD oxides with bronze type structure that are able to host a variable amount of alkaline ions. After his PhD, he, achieved, he was postdoc at the Stanford University with Professor Bob Hukins. And here he did a very important experiment for the later development of lithium ion batteries. The team, Professor Stanley Whittingham, who was then a doctor with Professor Bob Hukin, measured for the first time the ionic conductivity of the sodium ion in a solid. This exper experiment was very important not only for the information they obtained, because they measured the the beta lumina that had been shown that it could have very high conductivities as a liquid, but also for that they had to develop electrodes able to insert and des disinsert reversibly ions in the crystalline structure. And the f there it is, the fact of having electrodes that insert and disinsert in a reversible manner the ions is the discovery that made possible the invention of uh, dischargeable batteries of lithium. After his postdoc stay in Stanford, Professor Whittingham was hired by the ExxonMobil Corporation, that's the current name, in order to develop materials in other energetic systems. And that's where he invented the first rechargeable lithium ion battery that was based on an insertion electrode, uh, titanium sulfur, that inserted and disinserted reversibly lithium ions with characteristics and features that had a very, very rapid, a good kinetics, and without changing the crystalline structure. That was the important thing. Exxon at that time bet for that battery, and he even marketed it, although later on it was removed from the market of alternative energies, and he, this battery was promptly removed from there. Professor Whittingham spent 16 years in the Exxon Mobile Corporation and four more years in Schumberberg. And after 20 years working in the industry in the Binghamton University in the state of New York, he retrieved him in order to, with all the knowledge that he brought from his experience in the industry, 
be again a university professor that could convey all that knowledge to his students. We have to acknowledge that the American universities are very good in doing this, in take, capturing and attracting researchers that have a wide experience in the industry. From his incorporation to Binghamton University, Professor Whittingham has been the director of one of the Northeastern Center for Chemical uh, Media Storage, I think she said, that is one of the research centers frontline uh, fin funded by the Energy Department of the United States. He has received a very wide funding during those years to achieve research in batteries. And at present, Professor Whittingham has embarked in a very ambitious project in order to produce lithium-ion batteries in the United States. And finally, before allowing you to listen to him, I would like to uh, comment a couple of more personal aspects, rather related with the links that exist before, between Professor Whittingham and the Spanish culture. Three brief comments. The first one, the wife of Professor Whittingham is Professor of Spanish at the Osewa University in New York State, Oswego, and also something Spanish uh, probably he will understand. And on the other hand, Professor Stanley Whittingham is member, foreign member of the Royal Academy of Sciences, Exact Sciences in Spain. And in fact, tomorrow he's going to receive his uh, diploma as a foreign member due to reasons of COVID. He has been unable to receive it before. And the third data is that his relations with Spanish scientists he has co-edited a book, that is a book of abstracts of the symposium of the MRS, together with Professor Miguel Ángel Alario Franco, who is also academician of the Royal Academy of Sciences and honorific professor in the University of Complutense University. They collect the state of the art of science of chemistry in solid state at that time in 2002. Well, I hope, having given you with this summary a brief uh, overview of Professor Whittingham, although I hope that you will know him much better after listening to his talk that we are all eager to uh, listen to. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you, Professor Whittingham, for coming here today. Thank you very much for all those kind words and my apologies. My wife speaks Spanish, I don't. <laughs> um, so it's a great honor to come here and I want to tell you a bit about um, what I've done and some of the demands of the future and where we need to go. But first I have to thank the US Department of Energy who supported my work for the last close to 30 years. Without them, we wouldn't have made many of the breakthroughs we have. But I want to point out what the Nobel Committee said. They said, we've laid the foundation, basically, of a clean society. But now we have to make it happen. We've done the basic research, now let's move on. All of you know about um, laptop computers, phones. They've disrupted us, but mainly in a positive manner. Let's just look at what um, a negative manner is. These are pictures all from the last, I think, 15 months. One, in fact, from, I think, two days ago. The one in the bottom right-hand corner, the floods in Valencia. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. There's hurricanes, there's storms, there's fires. Um, if you go to Banff National Park in Canada, we used to go there every two years. The Victoria Glacier, you could see it from the hotel just about. Today, it's essentially gone. So most of the glaciers in North America are melting. Those in Europe are also melting. So this is a major issue. It's disrupting us, and we have to do something about it. So in my lifetime, we've undergone at least two major disruptions. We're starting on the third one. When I went to college at Oxford, we had a computer there. It took up a whole Victorian house. It was full of um, what we call vacuum tubes. No such thing as semiconductors in those days. And it probably took 24 hours to do a calculation that probably takes 10 seconds on your iPhone today. But, so things have changed. 
And really, the big change is you now got instant communication of what's happening all around the world. And this has mostly been a positive thing. But in the last three years, we've seen a, a negative disruption, and that's COVID. It's disrupted all our lives and still disrupting them. And it's shown the limitation of global supply chains. But on the positive side, it's shown how fast we can change, make things happen. No, no one dreamed we could have a vaccine within 12 months, but this is what did happen. So we can do it if we want to. But we now have to adapt to climate change. No, we're not gonna roll back climate change, but hopefully we can stop it going worse than it is today. But we have to live with it. Clearly we have to do with much less fossil fuels, particularly coal. And we in New York State are very proud of the fact that not a single kilowatt hour of electricity is generated by burning coal anymore. This stopped uh, maybe a couple of years ago, but when I first um, joined the university there, there was a big coal plant, coal power plant in our town. And about 2010, they bought in a lithium ion storage facility put it right next to the coal power plant. Within one month, that coal power plant was turned off. It's never come on again. So a small battery can really replace these, what we call peak, uh, peak power plants. So we want clean energy. Really these days it's solar and wind dominate. In certain countries, Canada, obviously Switzerland and a few other places, there's lots of hydropower as well. But if you're doing solar and wind, you've got to store it. And the easiest way of storing it is to use batteries. But th there is another bigger way of storing energy, and that's pumped hydro. It's, it's all over Europe. The facility I show you there is one about um, 80 miles away from Bington. Um, these systems are exceedingly efficient these days. You get about 73 to 75% of the energy back using modern motors. But the challenge is there's really not many new sites where you can build pumped hydro, and the environmentalists don't like you have building lakes and flooding fields and things. But these are immense in size, and in, I expect here as well as in America, these are what we call used for seasonal storage. So you use much less power in the spring and the fall than you do in winter and summer. So you fill them up in the spring and, and empty them in the summer, then fill them up again in the fall and empty them in the winter. But batteries are much more flexible. You can have tiny ones, milliwatt hours, up to gigawatt hours. They can be fixed or they can be portable. And the other big plus is the instant switch on, switch off. Um, these pumped hydros take several minutes to start up, so even with them, you've got to have a temporary um, system. But let me thank um, a little company called ESSO. I don't know what it's called in this country now. In, in the US, it's now ExxonMobil. But they had the foresight back in the late 60s, early 70s. They wanted to become an energy company. They were the largest manufacturers of solar photovoltaic cells in North America for a time. They had fuel cell research with Alstom in France. We got into the battery area. They got into things, maybe a few older folks here remember things called word processors, the precursor to computers. They even had a chip company. So they were going to be what we call the bell labs of the energy industry. And they're very active for a while and they is where we really built the first lithium batteries. And I'll show you two examples on the right-hand side. This little paperweight we gave away as a gift to potential customers. This particular one has a solar cell in it and lithium battery and a little clock. This one still sits on my desk. We think it was built about 1976. It still works today. So lithium batteries can last a long time, and if any of you got heart pacemakers or anything like that, there are also lithium batteries in those today. At the bottom is a much larger battery. This one's about six inches by four inches, about an inch thick. Um, this was 
designed for electric vehicles, and this particular one went to an EV show in Chicago in 1977. And electric vehicles were hot in the 70s. Um, the oil companies felt that oil was going to peak about the year 2000 and then go down. There was also what we call the Saudi Arabia oil embargo of America, which caused problems. So it was a huge effort in electric vehicles again. So Exxon was interested in doing that. And the, the middle picture there is a copy of the original patent we got that was filed in 1973. So I should point out, sometime last month was the 50th anniversary of the first lithium batteries we made at, at Exxon. So where are we now? This is just a few examples of some of the electric vehicles. Um, the one on the left there is my wife is in there, and she, you notice by accident she matched her sweater with the, the wheels. And um, this is a car we rented in Bermuda for our 50th anniversary. Um, it, tourists are not allowed to drive cars in Bermuda until 2019 when they said tourists could drive electric vehicles. And this is an Italian electric vehicle, and it, they'd been on the island maybe two weeks. So we said we'd rent one for a couple of days. We got in it and they warned us, if you drive to the other end of the island, you'll have to recharge it before you come back. It won't make it all the way back. So we drove to the other end of the island, went to the recharging station, and they were still building it. <laughs> so fortunately, we found a little recharging station at the hotel part way back, got it recharged as we ate dinner, managed to get the car back. But range anxiety is real, and my wife will emphasize that. She didn't want, want to think of pushing it back to the hotel. The two pictures on the top right are from uh, just north of Seattle, Washington, where Packall, which is Peterbilt and a couple of other big truck manufacturers, um, have their test track, and now the opportunity of driving one of their big trucks and the garbage truck around their test track, and these are totally electric vehicles. So this particular truck is now in the Los Angeles docks, ferrying the containers back and forth. And the garbage truck is an obvious use. It's you no know, stop, start, raise low all day long. So electric vehicles are clearly going to take over some of these applications. And beneath that, I show you a, a couple of buses. Um, the BAE systems, one is made in Binghamton. The forklift truck by Raymond is also made in um, the Binghamton area. And beneath that is a nice BMW vehicle. So lithium batteries are dominating, taking over electric vehicles, and the only limitation today is we can't make enough batteries. Whoops. Um, so I already mentioned renewable energy. Clearly we need um, to store it with sun or wind. And I show you a couple of examples here. The biggest one at the bottom there is a facility about an hour and a half south of San Francisco. This is 1.6 gigawatt hours and they're expanding it to go to five gigawatt hours. This is by far the largest facility in the world today. And this one is not large enough to take all the excess solar energy generated in that region during lunchtime when the sun is shining. So they'd have to waste some of the solar energy at the moment. So there's a huge need for more storage. At the, the bottom right hand side, this is the small facility that I talked about. It's in Binghamton. This was next to the coal power plant. It worked very well. It's, as I said, it worked so well, the coal power plant closed down. The company who built it decided they could make more money in the state of Ohio, so they came, towed this away to the state of Ohio, and so it's now doing the same thing in that state. So a big advantage lithium-ion batteries have, they're in these containers. You can just tow these away, so you can use them for six months in one place, then take them to another place. And above that, at the top right, is a storage facility at, uh, in West Virginia for a wind farm. The wind goes up and down all the time, so it has to be smooth. So these lithium batteries smooth that energy and can shift it for up to about 12 hours. The third application, this is one um, we got involved with whilst in Stockholm three years ago. 
Um, two of the physicists and I talked live to these two astronauts on the International Space Station, and they had just finished replacing all the nickel metal hydride batteries on the space station. They store the solar energy with lithium ion, and they were very happy. The lithium ion batteries were half the size, half the weight, and were going to last twice as long. And the lady is from the um, state of Maine in the US. Her family is Swedish, as you can see from the cross on her jacket. And the fellow is from Italy. So it's truly an international space station. So lithium ion batteries are everywhere. And I expect if I ask you, is, is there anybody in this audience who doesn't have a lithium ion battery with them? Probably no hands going up. Right. So, very briefly, in case some of you don't know what a lithium ion battery is, or any battery, a battery has three components, a positive electrode, a negative electrode, and then the electrolyte in between. And when you discharge a battery, the lithium ions go through that electrolyte, and the electrons go through the external circuits, as I've shown here. So those are the three critical components. Um, Going through a little bit of the history, at Exxon, we used pure lithium metal as the anode initially. We found issues there, and I'll show you a picture shortly. Um, you get dendrites, which can short the cells, so we switched to a lithium aluminum alloy to make it safer. But that only lasts maybe 10 or 20 recharges. So it was Akira Yoshino in Japan who really developed the carbon-based anode. And I should point out here that um, what you see here is what we call intercalation compounds. What this means is you insert some guest species into a host lattice. And you can see the, in here the lithium ions are little green circles. And on the left-hand side is that graphite. It's a layered sheet. And if you've got old pencils, that's graphite that you're putting on your piece of paper. So the lithium can insert itself in that graphite, but the challenge is you need over 70 grams of graphite to store seven grams of lithium. So it's very inefficient, and the graphite also takes up half the volume of the cell. So if we want to make better batteries, we have to get rid of that. So right now the big effort is to move from carbon-based materials to eventually to pure lithium again, but in the meantime, tin or silicon, both those react with at least four lithium ions, so can store a lot of um, energy. But there are still some issues in making that successful. On the cathode side, we start out with the layered compound titanium disulfide. Um, John Goodenough, who was at Oxford at the time, read our paper and said, Oh, the compound I'm working on, lithium cobalt oxide, and he was interested in magnetic behavior, has essentially the same structure. I'm going to try it. Now, no self-respecting chemist would ever try it. We didn't do it. Bell Labs didn't do it. According to textbooks, cobalt-4 does not exist. So you should not be able to take lithium out of lithium cobalt oxide. John tried it, and it works. And that's what's in all your phones today. It's clearly, it's unstable, and I'll get back to that in a few, few minutes. But the big issue with cobalt, it's expensive. It comes from the Congo, and that half of it is child labor. So there's a huge push to get cobalt out of batteries. So most of the batteries used today are what we call NMC, which is a mixture of nickel, manganese, and cobalt, or NCA, which is nickel, cobalt, and aluminum. So that's what's in most of your vehicles. Um, about 20 years ago, John Goodenough also found that um, these lithium ion phosphates, what we call LFPs, also you could take the lithium in and out of the host structure with no issues. They work very well, and there were some folks at MIT, yet Ming Chang, who actually commercialized that material and showed it could be a useful battery. But it has a very low energy density, and I'll show you that in a minute. So we've been working, how can we increase it and make it better? Because in the end, what all of you want is infinite energy at zero cost and perfectly safe. So we're going to try to approach those levels, but we'll see. So this is where we stand now. Don't worry about all the numbers here. 
just look at in that red circle there, the percentage figures. That's the percentage of the theoretical energy we actually get in a commercial battery. So it varies from about 11% to 25%. So there's still a huge opportunity to increase that. And our goal is to, to move that to 50%. Um, and on the very right-hand column, on a weight basis, it similarly is about 25% today, and we want to improve that to 50%. So we're looking at new materials. How do we use more of the lithium? How do we get rid of that carbon? And a number of other issues of that sort. So the real effort today is increase the energy density, which will make the battery smaller, give you a longer range, and hopefully make them also lower cost. So we have what we call this Battery 500 Consortium in the United States. Again, don't worry about the specific numbers here. The goal, Battery 500, means you want 500 watt hours per kilogram in a commercial cell as compared to about 200 today. And just look at that plot on the left-hand side. All you need to look at is over the last five years, we've moved from about 50 cycles to over 600 cycles. At the same time, we've also increased the energy. And this is what this consortium has aimed to do. And it's about six universities and four national labs, so it's a big national consortium. And the data is in what we call these little pouch cells. And it's one of my ex-students, Jay Xiao, who's in charge of this. And these are real numbers. Now, I emphasize that because a challenge in this field there's far more hype than reality, but these are real numbers because what we do is you actually weigh that cell, measure its volume, and these are the numbers that come out. So we're on the right target. I say our goal is to get to 500, and we've got more than halfway there in the first five years. These particular materials have what we call this meatball morphology. You can see in the top right-hand side. So the agglomerates are very small particles into these larger particles. So what we want to do to um, reduce the cost and increase the energy in the end is to put more nickel in these materials and less cobalt, but there's a big challenge there. Again, don't worry too much about the numbers, but you can see in the bottom right-hand side there's the nickel content. The higher the nickel content, the higher the capacity of the materials, but the less stable. So all these materials, if you take lithium out, and the same with pure lithium cobalt oxide, they're unstable, so they can evolve oxygen. And under the right circumstances, they will evolve oxygen, and this is what causes thermal runaway and fires in the end. So the more nickel you put in, the less stable they are. So our goal is to increase the stability of those materials so we can increase the energy density, cut the cobalt out, and I'll just show you two variations. It doesn't really matter what else you put in these materials. The stability is directly related to the nickel content. One of the things we have to do, so we don't have to worry so much about the stability, is actually use all the material we have. So a challenge in these materials is you can take a lot of lithium out. When you put it back in, the last 10 to 15 percent won't go back in under normal conditions. So the, this is a reduced um, diffusion, so we're looking at that, and you can see what we call this as the first cycle loss. We have to get rid of this, we want to get to 400 or 500 watt hours per kilogram. And these particular materials, we say 811, that means 80% nickel, 10% manganese, and 10% cobalt. Let me go back and make a point. So what we've determined that this is diffusion related, so these atoms jump depending on the vacancies, and this, we describe it as the same situation as, say, in a, a conference room like this one. If 80% of all the seats are full, the empty seats are invariably in the middle of the rows. So if you want to put an extra person, everybody has to move. So it's exactly the same in these materials. So to get the last bit in there, it's much harder than the, the first part. So we decided we should be able to modify these materials so they, we can get it all in, and we've had some success by um, modifying them by either coating the surface 
or putting atoms inside. We stabilize this lattice, stops this oxygen release, and the material we found best for this was in fact um, niobium. We put 1% niobium in these materials, it get, part of it stays on the surface, part goes into the lattice. But in reality, it's quite a lot more complicated because when the niobium goes in the lattice, some of the manganese comes out. So the surface coating is in fact a niobium manganese mixed oxide. And you can see from the plot on the right hand side there, we've reduced that first cycle loss by about 50%. Our goal is to totally reduce it. If we increase the temperature from room temperature to say 35 degrees centigrade, no, a warm day in Madrid right in the summer. We don't have this first cycle loss at all. It all goes away with a slight increase in temperature. But what we've also found using this niobium, we don't lose any capacity on cycling it. So we can charge and recharge these materials hundreds of times, and I'll show you an example here. We've done it 200 times, and this is with 2% um, niobium in a lattice. You can see there's absolutely no loss in capacity at all. We have a lower initial capacity, which we have to solve, but we found if we substitute these lattices, we can make them extremely stable. And that's our, our goal right now, is to push the energy density up, stabilize the lattice. So as people were asking me earlier, how long does the lithium battery last? If we can make it very stable, it should last forever. And the, the reason niobium works, those meatballs tend to crack, they expand and contract in the absence of um, niobium, that cracking is minimized with the niobium there. So I mentioned you know, the iron phosphates as being a material of particular interest. No nickel, no cobalt, very low cost, but it's also low energy density. To increase the energy density, we've got to get more lithium in, so we've been looking at um, materials based on vanadium, so for the chemists in the audience, that means you can go from vanadium-5 to vanadium-4, then vanadium-3. So our goal was, can you in fact get two lithiums into a lattice, and that, is that lattice still stable after you've done that, or have you wrecked the lattice? So we wanted proof of concept we could do that, and we looked at this material. We found we could make this in a very simple manner. You just dissolve everything in the solution, heat it to about 200 degrees centigrade for a few days, and for commercial purposes, this is the waste heat temperature in a refinery or chemical plant, so it doesn't cost you any energy. Doing this, we made um, this crystal structure, nice tunnel structure, extremely stable, no loss of oxygen, so thermally stable and safe. And using this technique, we get these little, um, what we call cuboids, little tiny cubes. And then we can build a battery out of this. And you can see we've now got um, two plateaus. So we've got a four volt discharge and the two and a half, the four volt is the pl plus five to plus four and the other one's plus four to plus three. And we can go backwards and forwards and those of you who got good eyesight can see the black line is the first cycle, the purple one's the 50th. So the 50th cycle is in fact slightly better than the first cycle. So we've got proof of concept. We can, in fact, have a crystal lattice that will happily take up two lithium ions reversibly without destruction of that crystal lattice. So we're pursuing that now and trying to solve some of the other issues with it. The major issue with this material is a known oxidation catalyst. So it likes eating up our organic solvent molecules. So we have to solve that, but the material itself is perfectly stable. So a big effort throughout the world, particularly in the US, Japan, everybody says we've got to make solid state batteries, get rid of this organic solvent, that's the thing that burns mostly when you see fires. So the question always is, is that really the case? Are they safer? And I think many of you may have seen these, what they call these um, Bolori cars, you can drive them in Paris. These particular ones are in Indianapolis. They use um, lit pure lithium metal as the anode. They use a polymer as the electrolyte, and today they use lithium ion phosphate. And Michel Armand, who I think works in um, northern Spain at the moment, 
He's very proud of saying in Paris, folks have a tendency of burning cars when they're unhappy. And he claims they can burn the car, but the battery is still good afterwards. So um, is that really the case? So this is the um, Mercedes bus. Um, again, using the same battery made by Bellore in the Mercedes bus. Um, about a year ago, one of these buses caught fire in the bus depot in Stuttgart, um, burnt up. It burnt up 25 other buses as well, plus the whole building. So there's issues about the real stability and there hasn't been an official report yet, but the rumor is that on charging, they actually melted the lithium metal. Update, spring this year. Some similar buses, but these time the buses were Bellore, not a Mercedes buses, um, caught fire whilst in operation in the center of Paris. So there's clearly there's some issue with these systems. We don't know exactly what it is, but right today I would say there's no evidence that solid state batteries used certainly using polymers are any safer than liquid electrolytes. We have to solve the safety problems for them both. And I like to show this picture because people say, well, EVs are unsafe. They're no less safe than an internal combustion engine. So I often show to my students those two pictures in the center and on the right at the bottom, one's an electric vehicle and one's a $100,000 Nissan sports car. They both caught fire. The Nissan sports car is a gasoline car. They parked it on top of some dry leaves whilst they went hiking. The leaves caught fire underneath the car and the whole car went up. So wherever you store energy is inherently unsafe, so we have to make it safe. Um, there's been a number of issues in India with these small two-wheelers using very cheap batteries and they apparently quite often catch fire. So a key message, if you buy a battery, make sure it's a, in the US we say it's underwriters lab tested. You have a similar testing systems in Europe. You want to make sure you have a good battery. On the bottom right there is a battery storage facility in um, Australia. This had a little fire in it and had nothing to do with the battery itself. This was due to a coolant leak and a lot of the fires you hear about is not the battery's problem, it's invariably some of the electronics that catches fire that then causes problems with the battery. So what I want to end it with maybe a few kind of semi-political sort of statements. Um, as I said, during COVID, we learned that the supply chain, which is a global one, is no, it doesn't work. It causes you know, immense issues, both on um, security, and it's not in a sustainable system because the materials, as I mentioned, travel between 30 and 50,000 miles from the mine to the electric vehicle. Um, today's batteries take 40 to 80 kilowatt hours of electricity to make a one kilowatt hour battery. We have to solve those issues. Um, we have to eliminate the critical elements using science advances, or if we can find them locally, that's fine too, but it's, we scientists have to get rid of these expensive and critical elements. Um, particularly cobalt has to go. To put it, as I mentioned, cobalt is mostly from the Congo. There was cobalt in other parts of the world. So a cobalt mine opened up in the state of Idaho in the US maybe three months ago. They mine it, but then all the processing's done in either Brazil or Finland. So it gets shipped to those countries, then gets shipped back to go into a battery, which is crazy. But um, the issue is we cannot get permitting done in North America in a reasonable amount of time. So even the mine takes 10 to 15 years to get permits, processing plants probably another five or 10 years. So we have to solve that. Things like graphite, we should be able to make in a petroleum plant or a chemical plant today with no issue. And point I want to make, and what I'm saying here applies equally to Europe, North America is a hotbed for battery activities. 
And that's the front end of it. You know, we're great scientists, we come up with great new ideas, we have a lot of patents. And really, the universities in the West lead the world. If you look, you know, there's almost no, I would say, chemistry IP coming out of Asia. It's all out of Europe or, or America. But when we get down to it, we come up with the great ideas, then you want to make a thousand batteries to test them for a potential customer. Five years ago, you could not do that in Europe. I think you can now. Um, you still can't do that in North America, so you ship them off to Asia, they make a thousand, but then they make a million. So you don't have a business. So we have to solve that problem. We're looking at some of them, and I want to give you a few examples of what we're trying to particularly do. So this is a scenario we have, probably more accurately to say yesterday. So we have a lot of chemistry, we have small R&D efforts running universities or startup companies, then everything goes to Asia, and then it comes back, in our case, to US, in your case, it would be to Europe. So what we are planning to do is to build a facility four miles from our university. It will be in an old IBM facility. So where we live is where IBM started out. They probably had 10,000 employees there 15 years ago. Then they closed down all their manufacturing. So plenty of buildings there. So our goal there is to build a large pilot facility so manufacturers can test their ideas out. But equally important to encourage American companies who make equipment to switch over and make equipment to make batteries. Now, there's almost essentially no equipment made in North America, very little in Europe. It's all made in Asia, so we want to change that around. And we're not trying to catch up with the Asians. There's no way we'll catch up with them. We have to leapfrog them and come up with better technologies better methods of doing things. So this project, which we call New Energy in New York, um, we got $113 million to set this up, which in your, I think today is about the same amount. Um, it has five parts in it. We have this facility where we're going to make the prototypes. We have a big effort on how do we improve the supply chain so we can get the materials in. And the biggest challenge we found with all the companies, there's no workers, so we have to train workers, from floor workers to power engineers, how to connect batteries to the solar cells, the electric vehicles, and so on. Big issue in America, and in particularly where IBM was, those 10,000 workers left. That's a destitute town now. Our goal is to really revamp that town, build back the jobs there, and get the people working. And to do all this, and we start up companies, and that's what we call the acceleration part of this effort. So this um, facility itself, I think I've already mentioned it, we want to encourage American equipment manufacturers. Um, we want to leapfrog the Asians, and we want to change the way we make the batteries so we get rid of all the toxic materials in there. One of these is this organic material called NMP, where you make the paste to make the electrodes. It's my understanding the European community is going to ban this within the next year or two. So we've got to find an alternative there. And we want to make industrial scale batteries, not in the giga what our scale, but enough to do prototyping. Um, what Britain has done, they've got what they call BIC, which is a similar effort to what we're doing, but their facility is one gigawatt hour per year, in our mind, far too large. So we want to keep our small, we want to keep it flexible. So our production line will be flexible enough so equipment manufacturers can come in and say, we've got a new piece of equipment, can we put it into your line and test it out? So to conclude a couple of slides, um, if we're looking at energy storage, lithium battery systems are going to dominate for, we think, the next five or ten years. It's not that there's nothing else out there, but whatever out there has to come in at lower cost than lithium iron to get into the market. So it's going to be tough. We have to have new mining techniques, which are cleaner. 
We've got to start using electrochemistry rather than carbothermal to make the metals, so it'll be cleaner there as well. We've got to have better recycling technologies. Some recycling today basically burns everything, creates an oxide ore. That's not the way to go. As we move into storage, hydrogen is clearly a clean medium. It's hydrogen or it might be ammonia. If we're using um, large vehicles, batteries are not the answer. So we're going to use, say, hydrogen fuel cells combined with a battery to make it. And we need regional supply chains. I'd say this is underway in Europe right now. And our goal is to have batteries that are made in America and for you made in Europe so we don't, they don't get shipped halfway around the world with all those um, costs. And also we need a clean ecosystem. So put it in perspective, was it about two weeks ago, our facility was officially started. On the left-hand side there is the Undersecretary for the Economic Development Agency. She visited the Giga factory we have over in Endicott. This is making some phosphate things. And we're explaining to her exactly what, how big the batteries will be and what's happening. And on the right-hand side, some of you may recognize um, Senator Schumer, he's the leader of the Senate in the US, and thank God he will be the leader for the next two years as well, so we won't have total chaos. So he's, been, he's a real champion of green energy, of solar, thermal, and energy storage, and he came up to Binghamton to open up our facility as well. Just uh, closing remarks, energy storage is just one example where globalization has gone too far. We have to roll it back, as already mentioned, semiconductors covered mass. We've got to emphasize sustainability. Whatever we do has to be sustainable. It means we have to recycle, and we have to recycle within our own regions. So the point I want to make at the bottom, we as developed nations can't ship all that junk off to the third world countries. It's a mess there, and then, then it floats back across the oceans to us anyway. So we have to recycle all our plastics, all our clothing, and all our electronics themselves. And I will stop there and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, tenemos tiempo para algunas preguntas que sean cortas y precisas. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you for, for the presentation and for the insights into the question of the uh, regionalization of the, of the change. When you mentioned Asia, uh, you were refri referring to China particularly, or you are saying that we have to refrain from uh, having any in, uh, sorry, uh, Asian country in the chain for producing batteries? And secondly, in terms of energy, all these new materials, uh, to get uh, the new material, what is the energy content that we need to do all these processes? Because probably we need battery, but at the same time we're taking so much energy, that probably we could use those fossil fuels to do other things because we are losing a lot of energy in, in, in doing this. It's like having hydrogen for, through electrolytes. You know, why, why are we doing all this runabout? So, I thought it was a small uh, question. I'm not a chemist, by the way, a chemist, but I follow very closely. So um, essentially, all the graphite used in batteries today goes through China at some point. Almost all the cobalt goes through China. So they dominate those markets. That's not, you know, on a security basis, that's not sustainable. It has to stop, and that's where a lot of the energy is involved, just shipping the materials. So there's a big push to um, make graphite in other parts of the world. For lithium itself, it turns out the largest producer of lithium in the world right now is Australia, followed by South America. And certainly Ameri North America is going to start getting more of their lithium, I think, from Australia. It's in quotes what the federal government defines as a friendly nation. Is not a nation like Russia who says, tomorrow we're going to cut off your gas. 
There's concerns that China could say that for lithium batteries. But the, the main thing is, it's not any one particular nation. You don't want any country to dominate the supply chain of any commodity. No, a country can have 30%, but not 90% or 95%. That's just not good. Um, as far as the energy today, I say it takes about 60 kilowatt hours of energy to make a one kilowatt hour battery. Quite a lot of that's in transportation, so we can cut that back. Um, on the clean, using clean energy, I said, New York State, we don't make any electricity from um, coal. We're very fortunate we get quite a lot of electricity from Quebec, and that's 90 odd percent of that's hydropower, so that's clean energy, and that's what they're going to use to make hydrogen. And also in the US, there's three nuclear power plants next to Oswego, where my wife teaches. They're also going to be generating hydrogen using that nuclear power. So you're right, there's no point in um, having electric vehicles if you're then going to make the electricity from coal. It defeats the whole purpose. So I think we have to go to clean electricity, then we can put that in into the vehicles. Más preguntas? Uh, professor, did I actually hear or did you actually say that in the long range batteries will last forever? There will be no need for recycling? Or oh, in the last part of your presentation, you certainly did mention recycling, which is critical. So maybe I did, I'm poor of hearing. So would you, <laughs> did you actually say that? The long-term role is uh, lifetime batteries? So the answer to that one, it depends how much you're willing to pay. You can make a battery that will last almost forever, but it may cost you a million dollars or a million euros. So that little battery that I have that's close to 50 years old now, that's a welded case battery, very expensive. But if you've got your smartphone, how often do you change that phone? Every three or four years? So you don't want to pay for a battery that's going to last, say, 10 years. So the cost of the battery is, you know, depends on how long you want to, to live, and for automobiles, EVs, they give warranty of eight to 10 years. Grid storage, we know they like 20, 25 years. So it's a question of economics. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Whittingham, for visiting us to Madrid. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is related to your early work at ExxonMobil. Um, did you realize, you were aware about the importance of the work that you were doing at that time? I mean, about the impact that this research will have in the, in the future? This is one question. Our goal was to, Exxon's goal was to make electric vehicles, so we have to make it clean vehicles. There's no such thing as um, small computers, smartphones, no one had dreamed of that. Um, the company that made lithium batteries economically successful was Sony, because they're the electronic devices, and they're what we call a vertically integrated company. They wanted to make everything themselves. So they needed batteries for their electronic devices, so they identified lithium batteries as the best way to go. So they put a lot of money into making it commercially successful. Thank you. And the second question is related to the, to the comment that you made about the safety of the batteries. I mean, you mentioned that uh, uh, liquid electrolytes are um, uh, safer, I mean, in the same range than polymer. But uh, I disagree with you partially or maybe <laughs> completely because uh, I think that we need to maybe specify more about this uh, type of batteries in terms of, uh, I mean, if you have a metal ion battery uh, containing liquid electrolyte, maybe if you go to throw the thermal runaway 
and there is a big uh, uh, explosion of fire, of course, that any of them are uh, safe anymore. But uh, in my opinion, polymers are, I mean, at, at least from the thermal uh, point of view, from the thermal properties, are less flammable and I think that's safer than, than organic solvents that are in our uh, pocket these days. What is your opinion about this? Let me say in the last no, 10 so years when these solid polymer batteries have been, there's been no issues at all until one year ago. There was no issue at all in the small cars. The issues all came in the very large batteries they're using in fully electric buses. So one has to wonder whether it's a, also an electronic issue, they're charging them too fast or doing some other issues. We know using the polymer batteries, you have to have much slower charging than say with the liquid batteries and the polymer batteries operate about 70 degrees centigrade as opposed to room temperature. So remember a battery is a whole system. Every part of that system has to work. So they're still identifying really what the issues are and if it really is the case in the Stuttgart buses, the lithium melted, there was a serious problem with the, you know, the electronic control and safety features. It shouldn't have got that hot in the first place. Thank you. I'm curious about reuse and recycling of batteries. Um, you, you put up the research that you're, and, and the center you're establishing. How is reuse and recycling of batteries reflected in, in your work? And, and what challenges do you see there? I myself don't, don't do much in that area. One of my ex-students has a recycling company. I, I think um, there's some interest in reuse. But the real issue, if you've got a 15-year-old battery, will that chemistry still be of interest today? Or will the chemistry have changed? So the, the, the really large area of recycling today is in the manufacturing plants. So there's about a 10 to 15% wastage in manufacturing. That's good material which they can take out and recycle straight back into the manufacturing facility. Then they'll feed into the used batteries after that. Um, I said, my ex-student, he's, he's trying to take the material directly out, rejuvenate it and put it into new batteries. Other people turn it into what's called black mass. So that's uh, all with nickel, manganese, cobalt, aluminum, copper in it. And then they send that back to the um, processing companies to split out the various elements. So there's a huge range of opportunities there and no one's decided yet which is the best one. But today, the largest recycling is from the gigafactories themselves. Is there enough lithium on Earth for as much as we are going to need? Um, that's a question we all get all the time. There's certainly enough for all electric vehicles we're going to need. The perception is on the electric vehicles in about 10 years' time, most of the lithium will come from recycled old batteries. If we want to build um, terawatt no, hours of um, grid storage, there may be an issue with not having enough lithium. But it always turns out that there's sufficient demand and the price is right people will find it. So there's a lot of lithium in, I say, in Australia, um, quite a lot in South America. When I started in this field, all lithium in the United States came from North Carolina. So if you look up a lithium company in your Google or somewhere, you'll find all the headquarters are in North Carolina. All, that was all hard rock mining. And some of those companies today are trying to rejuvenate some of those mines and get them going again. It all depends on you know, what you're willing to pay. There's lithium out there. It's even people saying there's enough lithium in the ocean to get it, but that seems to me a bit expensive to get that low quality lithium out. But for electric vehicles, we don't think there's an issue.
Thank you very much, Professor Whittingham. Uh, going back to the point of recycling, and if we think we want to make cheaper batteries or lower cost batteries, will this be not um, a distraction towards recycling? Because, I mean, uh, recycling companies want to make money, and if we make batteries of lower cost materials, then they might not be interested in recycling. So how can we, where will be the compromise? Or we just need politicians to regulate on this? I mean, what, what will be a, a solution or a way to go? So there's no question that politicians are regulating it, no. We have to recycle everything in the United States. It's my understanding in Germany, all cars have to be recycled. The company has to be willing to take them back. They get around that by exporting them to Eastern Europe, I understand, but, but um, everything will be recycled. Um, companies say they're making money now. You know, if you, you recycle all your iPhones, go in the, your drawers at home. How many old phones you've got there, old computers? Those are all pure lithium cobalt oxide. So in the EV batteries, in that battery is only 10% cobalt. So a lot of phones can help out there. But it will be much cheaper to recycle than to mine. That's the, no, recycling will be the mine of the future, if you like. Okay, well I love the slides. <laughs> I love your talk, of course, I knew I was going to love it, but I'm going to change the subject now because you, well, you control absolutely this uh, system. But what about the, the original slide you put, catastrophes all over, uh, flooding, in, uh, everything is going bad. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Well, we have to be optimistic, yes. but are you really optimistic? Yes, no. My wife won't let me buy a home on the ocean for obvious reasons. And we're not going to buy a home in a tornado belt or anything like that. So our house is on the side of a hill. We used to live in New Jersey, and we got water in the basement. She said never again, so we, we built on hillsides. You, you, people have to change the way they want to live. You can't live in... Um, very low areas, but it's going to be frequent flooding, despite what our ex-president Trump said. He has a home in Miami. High tides, the sea comes over the main street today. So we have to you know, change what we're doing. We can't keep living in those places where these catastrophes are worse. So people are going to have to move. They're going to have to shift. And you know, a lot of people in New York State, you know, we're fairly cold climate, they will say, come on, global warming, we're waiting for you. Not everybody can do that. No. Um, I th no. There are issues. The real issue with global warming is that human population keeps increasing and increasing. And if we all want to use the same amount of energy, it's going to get worse and worse. So, we, no. Some of us have to use much less energy. We in North America, as probably most of you know, use twice as much energy per capita as Europeans use. That, that has to change. Now, we like big cars, and um, we don't use diesel anymore to speak of, but um, you know, a lot, the way we do things have to change. The distances in America are much bigger than in Europe, so you know, public transportation is difficult except on the East Coast between the major cities. But things have to change, and I think people are realizing that. And Thank you very much for your talk, Professor Whittingham, and congratulations on your Nobel Prize. Um, I'm fascinated by the fact that you went back to uh, investigate new areas, and you came, and you're, it seems like you're full on looking at uh, discovering new things. So perhaps another Nobel Prize in the future. Um, I was curious about the fact that you didn't really emphasize so much the hydrogen storage. And in a country like Spain, which apparently in the next few years is going to have another 100 gigawatts, which is double the uh, installed capacity today, 
they don't seem to be really worried about how to store all that excess energy. Um, is what percentage or how do you see hydrogen and electric, uh, uh, electronic or lithium, lithium batteries coexisting? And also, given your investigative nature, what about uh, duplicating the photosynthesis, the chemistry of nature, and with solar ponds and other organic materials? So all, all those are good ideas. The issue with hydrogen today, making it electrochemically, is very energy intensive. So it's not economically viable. We have to find better ways of making green hydrogen, which are low cost. Um, as far as electric vehicles go, small ones using fuel cells make absolutely no sense at all in my mind. You might as well put the electricity into batteries rather than putting electricity into a fuel cell, then making hydrogen, and then running it from there. But um, there are buses in the United States which are fuel cell powered, but remember, Every fuel cell vehicle also needs a very large battery as well. Fuel cell operates at constant output. It cannot do regenerative braking. So, no, the issues there, where there's a lot of effort right now is um, using fuel cells with hydrogen, and you generate the hydrogen from clean energy at what we call the rest stops on the big highways, and that'll go into trucks not into cars, so large trucks. You cannot drive you know, a 10 or 20 ton truck using batteries. You have more batteries than you know, what you want to carry in it. So there's you know, opportunities for hydrogen. There's a lot of interest these days in ammonia that may be a more efficient energy carrier than hydrogen. Hydrogen's difficult to store, has to be at a high pressure. Um, you can't ship it through pipes easily because of hydrogen embrittlement. It has to be diluted with natural gas or something else. So I think there's no a renewed interest in ammonia. And remember, fuel cells and hydrogen have been around longer than batteries have been around. And we haven't really solved the you know, electrocatalytic effects on the electrodes. How do you make the hydrogen very efficient? We have to do that. And we've been pushing. We need more fundamental R&D on those electrochemical reactions. Thank you. <clears throat> How would you fly in future? How would a plane should be propelled? I think that, that's one area where um, the petroleum industry will reign supreme. There's a lot of talk about um, you know, electric flight. There's a lot of interest. It's going to happen for small flights. For example, they're looking in the Seattle area where there's an Israeli company making a regular takeoff plane rather than a vertical one um, to go from Seattle itself to all the little islands, which are maybe 5, 10, 20 miles away to take goods and maybe be pilotless. Huge interest for rescue missions, getting first aid to people in remote areas, um, locating where there's been accidents and things like that. But um, for large vehicles, it's large planes. You can't, can't go very far and people have emphasized as well. And I expect the same rules in Europe as in the US. Using a battery, you can probably get 20 minutes of flight, plus you've got to have 20 minutes remaining after that plane lands. Those are FAA rules, just in case anything goes wrong. So you'll never use more than 50% of the battery. And there's been a lot of interest in vertical takeoff. That uses a tremendous amount of power, and what surprised me, it takes as much, if not more power, to land it than to take off, because you have to land it in a controlled manner. So this Israeli company in, in Seattle has a regular um, type plane with the batteries forming the structure of the plane and the body of the plane also designed so it gives partial lift as well. So I think there's interest there for specialized applications, but no, I'm not gonna be flying from New York to Madrid on an electric, electric plane anytime soon. 
Desgraciadamente tenemos que terminar ya la sesión científica eh, y yo quiero agradecer to thank again Professor Whittingham and also to the audience. So in next in a few next weeks we are going to have also very interesting talks and you people are invited to attend it. In particular there is going to be a conference on December 12th, in which we are going to mix two things which look very different, the discovery of the Bosch Higgs boson, coronavirus, and what is the relevance of basic research. So you are invited to attend this next conference at the Fundación Areces. Thank you very much again.